Okay everyone, let's take a quick tour around the world of some of the main biomes on our planet. Before we do that, what the heck is a biome? The formal definition is a large naturally occurring community of plants and wildlife occupying a major habitat, like a forest or tundra. But let's also include people in that as well. Indigenous people are adapted to their land. When we look at maps like these, we should understand that these categories are based on things like plants as key indicators, weather patterns, wildlife, and other things. However, we know that nature doesn't confine herself to a box and that there are many variations of vegetation communities that can be further subdivided within the five main types. You can see those many subdivisions in the left-hand column. We live on a super diverse planet. One thing to pay attention to is the regional location of these biomes. They're all directly related to their weather patterns. On this map, you can see where our home has different zones where these biomes occur. Most of us taking this class fall into the temperate zone right above the Tropic of Cancer. Pretty much all of the weather patterns on the planet are associated with the water currents in the oceans. The North Pole and the South Pole are especially important when the water temperatures start to change in those locations. It affects everybody on the planet. During normal conditions in the Pacific Ocean, trade winds blow west along the equator, taking warm water from South America towards Asia. To replace that warm water, cold water rises from the depths, a process called upwelling, and those are our normal conditions. There are two opposing conditions, however, and they're called El Nino and La Nina. Both have global impacts on weather, wildfires, ecosystems, and economies, by changing food abundance across the planet. These conditions typically last nine to 12 months, but lately they've been lasting for years. They don't have a regular pattern, so scientists have to closely monitor water temperatures. Right now we're leaving a La Nina, which has meant terrible drought in the Southern US, and going into an El Nino, which means lots of rain. It rained at my house this morning and I almost forgot what it sounded like. When these patterns vacillate so much, what does that mean for plants and everyone who depends on them? There are many indigenous people around the world that live in coastal areas or in areas that are highly susceptible to drought. For example, in Alaska and many of the Micronesian islands, people are now having to start to protect their villages from ocean storms and rising water. There are villages that are relocating as we speak. So let's take a quick and general tour of the five main biomes around the planet, since we all belong to this big, beautiful place. We'll start with our aquatic biome, which includes both freshwater and marine water habitats. It includes five main oceans, the Pacific, Atlantic, Indian, Arctic, and Southern, as well as many smaller gulfs and bays. The key indicator here is that marine water is very salty versus fresh or mixed water. This is a hawksbill turtle swimming next to a coral reef at the Terneff Atoll in Belize. But there are millions of species of fish, plankton, corals, mammals, birds, and many, many others that are part of the ocean cycle of life. If the ocean dies, we all die because everything is interconnected. For the aquatic biome, we have the marine subcategory, which is the biggest biome in the world and covers about 70% of the planet's surface. That's a lot of water. About 27 million indigenous people across 87 countries live in coastal communities. The ocean's currents and their temperatures regulate our weather patterns too. So if you want to take care of our plants and people and animals here where we live, you should also learn about the oceans and keep tabs on their water temperatures if you're needing rain for your own landscapes. The other aquatic subcategory is freshwater. That includes ponds, lakes, streams, rivers, and wetlands all around the world. Here you can see the Everglades of Florida, one of the largest wetlands in the world and used to be even larger before agriculture and development started taking their toll. This is the land of the Seminole and Miccosukee who are fighting to preserve what's left. Now, of course, the Everglades mix their waters with the salty ocean to create what we call estuarine waters. So this is a very unique system because so much happens when these different ecosystems meet up. So let's move on to land and we'll start with grasslands. This one happens to be in Northern Eurasia, one of the world's largest. These grasslands occupy hundreds of thousands of square miles of land and feed millions of people and animals. Many of the shrubs and grasses found here are related to the grasses in North America, 
but have their own soil plant animal relationships going on. We'll learn about that later. So moving on to forests, there are lots of different kinds. The Amazon forest, of course, is definitely worth mentioning. Because of its location and its size, some people call it the lungs of the planet because it produces so much oxygen. But remember, we talked about this, it also absorbs huge amounts of carbon and helps us clean the air. Over three million species of plants and animals are found here. And then we have the desert biomes. Of course, the key characteristic here is low rainfall and the desert plants have all adapted to water conservation along with the desert's animals. There are deserts all over the world. However, climate change is even affecting them. We talked about Hashan, the saguaro cactus that lives in the Sonoran Desert. And if it gets too much rain, it will bust open and die. It would take it thousands of years to adapt to different rainfall patterns. And then finally, we come to the fifth main biome, and that's the tundra. Arctic tundra occurs in the far northern hemisphere, north of the taiga belt, or those swampy forests where the moose live. The word tundra usually refers only to the areas where the subsoil is permafrost, or permanently frozen soil. But that's starting to defrost too with rising temperatures, and underneath, it's releasing a lot of methane gas into the air. It's become a huge problem. Here are variations of the biomes called ecoregions. Every continent has them. And those ecoregions can be broken down even further into areas that we're familiar with on the western side of the continent. Let's start with the sagebrush steppe. You can see that it's found throughout the west in what we call the Great Basin, in places like the Oahe Desert between Oregon and Idaho. These ecosystems cover huge areas of western North America and are the largest type of rangeland ecosystem here on this continent. These systems evolved with grazing animals and fire. Although these communities are all a little bit different in appearance and plant composition, the key is that they're dominated by sagebrush plants, which we'll learn more about later. These plants are super important to animals such as pronghorn antelope, black-tailed jackrabbits, and sage grouse. Sagebrush also provides cover for grasses and helps store moisture from winter storms. You can see here that this biome has a very wide distribution and is home to numerous indigenous cultures throughout the West that have a close relationship with these plants and animal species. Now let's move on to the oak woodlands. These systems evolved with fire that was used by indigenous people while managing their landscapes for acorns and forage for wildlife. And because oak is fire resistant, you can see why you have this mixture of trees and grass. California is most known for this ecosystem. But oak woodlands, or sometimes called oak savannas, are also found throughout Arizona, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Texas. Each area varies with their species, but live oak and grass savannas are the main characteristic. You can see their range here, and I'm betting that some of you know where some of these woodland patches can be found that aren't on this map. Oak trees are super important to the ecosystem because they retain nutrients under their canopies, which helps other plants. As a result, these biomes produce a lot of forage for grazers, but also provide a lot of energy for animals and humans that eat acorns. Some of the species found here are native grasses, but in all honesty, native species are harder and harder to come by these days, as most other grasses and forbs have been introduced from other places since colonization. This is why the knowledge of our elders is so important, to understand how these landscapes used to look and how to make them healthy again. Then we have our western forest, where many of us live. They're quite extensive and are found along the backbone of Turtle Island. These are the beautiful crazy mountains, or the Awaha Wapia, which are sacred to the Upsalaga, crow people. The majestic fir, pine, and spruce trees live here, and as you move further west toward the coast, you'll find the tall redwoods and hemlocks. If you're not from here, and you haven't walked through the cedar hemlock forest that's in Picani country, but now located in Glacier National Park, you should go see it. It's an amazing forest. And you can see here that our western forests continue down the backbone to southern Mexico to what we call the relic forests that now live only in the highest elevations. And we call it the Sierra Madre, the mother mountain. Some people call them sky islands. Grizzly bears used to extend all the way down along this beautiful connection of mountains. In the south, they ate acorns of the oak trees, and in the north, the nuts of the white bark pine. This is where I've worked almost all my life. Moving along on our tour, 
We're walking, walking, walking. Okay, now we've arrived at the chaparral. The name is derived from the Spanish word for short because of its short bushes. But its other name should be called fuel. Chaparral is definitely an ecosystem that evolved with fire. And its fire regime is about every 30 years or even more frequent now that climate change has set in. Basically, it's supposed to burn. And then people like to build their houses in the middle of it, which makes for the big news stories on California fires. You can see the main chaparral communities on this map. It's the light green color and can be found in several countries, states, and tribal nations. Next, we find ourselves flying across the Pinyon Juniper Woodland. Here you see the beautiful bear's ears in Utah that is so sacred to the Hopi, Diné, Utes, Zuni, and many other tribes. This regional biome is found across many tribal nations and in the states of Arizona, Colorado, Nevada, New Mexico, Utah, Texas, and down into Mexico, which was left off the map, of course. While the utilitarian society may view this as relatively unproductive for farming or forage production, the traditional foods of indigenous people and animals are actually quite common. The pinyon and the juniper are used for food, medicines, and ceremonies. We might need to take a short refreshment break to hydrate before we head out into the not-so-green landscape of the saltbrush desert. Okay. Make sure you wear a coat or sunscreen for this one because the saltbrush desert is either freezing cold or blistering hot, and it's usually covered with bands of feral horses. The saltbrush desert areas are known for having salty soils, which plants like sagebrush, saltbush, Indian rice grass, blue grama, and western wheatgrass like. In the saltbrush desert, vegetation is sparse and fairly low-lying, and looks pretty bleak to the naked eye. But the saltbush is actually pretty good forage for grazers and browsers, in the fall and then winter after the grasses dry up. It's also excellent quail and wildlife habitat. And by the way, we'll have some lessons on our grasses later, but for now, take some time to Google images of plants and grasses in these different biomes and ecoregions so you can become familiar with them. Okay, moving along to the beautiful Chihuahuan Desert. Look, someone finally included the entire range on the map. Anyway, one of the key indicators here is the creosote bush. It's one of my favorite smells. It's also home to many small cacti and agaves such as the yucca, so it's really good bat habitat and also home to the aplomado falcon. This picture here is pretty typical. The grasslands of the Chihuahuan Desert are extensive and diverse, and buffalo ventured that far south to graze. I believe the oldest quote documented, whatever that means, buffalo jump is right on the U.S.-Mexico border close to Big Bend National Park. Now let's move on over to California again and visit the Mojave Desert with its famous plant, the Joshua Tree. It's also the driest desert in North America. Wow. Its range is pretty straightforward with a few fingers extending into Utah and Arizona. A really interesting film is called The Women in the Sand and tells the story about the battle between the Timbisha Shoshone and the National Park Service. But you also learn about how the tribe has adapted to such an extreme environment. Moving back inland again, we've already learned about the Sonoran Desert, home of the Tana Atham and the Saguaro Cactus, or Hashan. This is a very dry desert, but experiences the wonderful monsoons of summer, which turns the desert into a garden. There are a few things that smell better than the Sonoran Desert after a rain. You can almost hear the plants guzzling the water. It's one of my favorite places. Finally, we come to our beautiful prairies, or what's remaining. I can only imagine what many of your ancestors saw before these amazing ecoregions were altered. Historically, grasslands were the largest vegetation formation in North America, but that's no longer the case, so we should all be working double time to restore them. As you know, many tribes and other partners are doing just that, and this is why botany is so important, so you can learn to do it too. So now our biome journey is over, but let's just kind of lay back in a patch of grass and just think about the things that we've seen. Here's a nice reminder for you to enjoy.
Yeah.